them, you can use the, I show uh, acrylic, clear acrylic bags. You can buy those on Amazon and just slip them into that bag and give them as a gift that way. Um, or you can mat them. Um, Jerry's sells these mats and I'm gonna hold this up and you can put your, your uh, piece in a larger mat and then put it in a frame. So it makes a nice little jewel to give somebody. Um, I work, as I said, I work in pastels. So generally what I do is I just cut up scraps of paper. Um, the paper that's in the center is UART. That's typically what I work on um, because I like it. It, it um, allows me to work in a wet media and then apply dry pastel over it. The other, um, the darker gray ones are samples that I got from, um, I think it was Dakota Pastel when I ordered a bunch of pastels one time, they sent these. And I did call them and ask them if they made those available and they don't, but it's, um, it's art spectrum paper, which I'm not as crazy about um, because you can't apply wet media to it, but, um, but they make nice little, you know, it's, it's a nice um, taupey background. And so um, it's just a little bit different from the surface that I'm used to working on. I also will print out, um, the images that I'm gonna work from fairly small. You wanna keep pretty simple with these um, because you're gonna hear my dog bar barking in the background. <laughs> um, you wanna keep pretty simple with these. So I find that if I work from a small image, it, um, it keeps me from getting too caught up in details. So I'm just showing you simply that I, um, I print them out on my color printer. And um, that way, you know, I can just put it up next to my, my paper and, um, you know, I have a reference right there. Typically I paint from my iPad when I'm doing a bigger painting because I like to paint from projected light, but these are really good to, um, to work from for this small format. So we can go to the next slide. I wanted to show you my pastel collection. It's kind of an addiction and, uh, um, and I'm not done. I just ordered another set. <laughs> so uh, that on the, on the right is my pastel drawer, which is great because I can close that up and the cats can't walk all over it, um, which they used to before I had a way to, um, to cover them up. And on the left is some of the colors that I'll be using tonight. I generally put out more colors than I actually use, but I like to have them on, all on hand. I'll be doing a demonstration of uh, fall trees. So I've got a lot of golds, rusts, greens, and some blues and grays for the sky. And then in the lower um, left-hand corner are my new pastels, which I use in my underpainting process. So I generally start with hard pastels and then I move to soft pastels on top. You can go to the next slide. And these are just um, showing you the presentation options either in the clear bags or um, with a mat or they sell little tiny frames at Michael's. They also sell these little tiny easels and I, I looked at them on Jerry's. I think I sent you guys a bunch of links but you could put them on, um, you can mount them on like foam core and put them on a little easel. So there's a lot of ways you can, you can share them with people. Next slide, please. And these are just some samples of some mini paintings that I did um, just to show you the photos and then the little paintings. And these are all um, three and a half by two and a half. That's the criteria for artist trading guards. You can pretty much do any media that you want, but they just need to be within that uh, size. And they also can be originals or they can be reproductions. So if you are trading or buying um, an artist trading card, just make sure you know what you're getting before you, um, before you buy it. You can go to the next slide. This is the, the fall tree is the one I'll be doing tonight. And if I get to this one, I'll do another um, small one. This is a, just um, a snow scene. And then the next slide. And this one I did on that um, art spectrum paper. So this had a gray background on it and then I built the color on top of it. Um, and this is out at Sawhill Ponds. 
I think that's it for that. Yeah. Um, and I also include it in, um, it's included in the chat. I think Jill put it in there. It's um, my process. I do a step-by-step -step process and I just wanted to share it with all of you. Um, it's how, how I do pastels for the most part. Um, sometimes I work other ways, but in general, um, I feel like I'm still learning so much always that um, I generally gravitate more towards this process that I have. Um, but taking a step back, one of the things that um, I find with doing the artist greeting cards is that it um, it's a way for me to do like a, not only if I decide to trade it as a, as a you know little gift, but I also do it as a color study in preparation for working on a larger piece. And um, I've got like, this is just a six by eight, but it's showing, here's the, um, the artist trading card. It's showing, you know, how the fidelity of the color and composition and everything is pretty close. And this gives me a chance to practice and figure things out before I take it up to a big piece. And then often what I'll do is this, then this, then a bigger piece. So um, it just gives you a chance. I always, I always like to say that you should do, you should do things not once, twice, but three or more times um, to really get it. And I find that that really helps me. It helps me know a piece really well. Um, so when you work small, it forces you to simplify and you can also produce them fairly quickly. I'm gonna be working in pastel, but you can choose you know, watercolor, gouache, acrylic, encaustic, pencil, pen and ink, um, or any mixed media. And I prefer to do mini landscapes, but um, I've seen one of the artists that I follow is Karen Margolis and she does everything, you know, like flowers, um, still life. You can do anything you want in terms of subject matter. And the benefits are they're quick. You don't waste a lot of materials. You can experiment with new surfaces and techniques and they can be studies for larger pieces. Um, and I already went over how you can present them. And I'll be painting in dry pastels. Um, I, in the PowerPoint, I showed you my collection of pastels. I use all different kinds of pastels. Probably my favorites are Terry Ludwig's and we're really lucky. He um, has a shop in Denver and um, I don't know if they're doing it in COVID, but you can go down there and actually buy them one-on-one. -on -one. And um, he generally has what he calls a garage sale. So you can buy broken um, pieces that are less expensive because his pastels are about $6 a stick now. So they get very expensive. So what I do in my process is um, my step-by-step -step is I start with a simple pencil, pencil sketch. Usually I use like a pastel pencil. I then um, use uh, the new pastels to lay in the um, block in my shapes. And then I use an alcohol wash to solidify those shapes. And then I start laying in the pastel on top of that. And that's what I'm going to do tonight. Um, generally, when I'm working with an alcohol underpainting, I'll mount my paper to like a foam core or to a board. And I use, um, I use this stuff that's, um, it's like a double stick adhesive board. It's acid free. And uh, so I, I mount it to the board into the back of my paper and then I let it sit under night, uh, overnight under like books and stuff so that I don't get any buckling on it. Um, so I also sent over my reference photos and I believe you guys got all the links for, um, for supports and um, all the presentation materials. And in my step-by-step, -step, what I do first um, is do a grayscale marker sketch. I always do a value study before I approach a painting. Just, it helps me understand it um, and figure out compositional details. Often I'll do three or four of these, sketch them out, you know, crop things different ways and um, really try to push what I'm seeing in the photo to, um, 
to make it a better composition. You know, I'll move things around. Um, and when you're working this, this small and in black and white, it's very easy to, to um, you know, start over again. You're not wasting a lot of time. Then I draw it on my board. Um, that's, that's kind of a sketch of um, with the pastel pencil. And I usually think about the rule of thirds with composition lines. This is just one method of composition. Um, I'm a, you know, I'm a fairly, I call myself an impressionist painter. I'm not super tight realistic, um, but I rely on realism and interpretation of realism in my painting. So in this case, I'm looking at the rule of thirds. I don't want anything right in the center. But, you know, rules are made to be broken. And so if you break them, just make sure you know what you're doing with them. So then um, this is my palette that I showed in the PowerPoint. Then I lay in my underpainting um, in dry media first. Then I do an alcohol wash. And then I start applying the pastel. And this is just showing how I um, start blocking in the colors and the layers. And then at the very end is when, you know, I really start making those, um, those very detailed marks. I try to stay pretty general until I get towards the end of the painting. So um, I think that's it. And I'll get going on the first demo. Now, a lot of people will work, um, they'll work on a, you know, like a, um, angled board or the work on a, you know, on their lap or something. I prefer with pastels to work vertically, even on these little guys, because um, I, the dust will fall off. And um, I just, I'm used to working that way. So my board is set up. I prefer to work on a black, this is black gator board. And I prefer also to use black tape because I don't want color interfering or influencing what I'm seeing in the photo and what I'm, what I'm putting down on my painting. Question about the alcohol. Um, I generally use the 70% um, isopropyl alcohol. And it, the reason for that, I mean, it's there, there's a 90% and a 70%, but um, the 70% doesn't dry quite as fast. So it allows me to push it around a little bit more. And yeah, you can just buy it at like King Supers, or you, you could. Typically, when we, when we got into COVID, I couldn't find alcohol anywhere. <laughs> so I think it's readily available now. So what I do is, um, and I don't know if you can see it very well. It looks like it's pretty washed out, but I've got a pencil sketch on here of the composition. What I do is I put in my, um, first thing I do is put in my horizon line. And in this case, I've got a really low horizon line. Um, and then I just block in like roughly the shapes. And from there, I start doing my, um, my block in with my new pastels. And, and what I'm gonna do is start just I'm going to use a darker brown kind of behind these trees with some purple. So underpainting is something that you kind of learn with practice what to use under different things. But generally, I um, use under the shadow areas and darker areas, I use this um, these are new pastels. It, this is a Cordoba brown. And then under the um, sunlit areas of the grass, I'll be using like an orange and um, and a uh, kind of a rust color. There you go. Now for that background. So I've kind of got it blocked in. 
And now I'm going to use an alcohol wash to paint. And I just use um, a cheap, these are called silver white brushes. Um, I think they're like a watercolor brush. So I just use those. Um, the sanded paper, the UART, tends to eat up the pastel. So um, you have to use a synthetic brush. This is, you know, this is for pastels. So uh, this is part of the process that I really enjoy because this is where you get to like play a little bit and the composition really starts to take shape. I'm just um, dipping my brush back in. Add a little bit of darkness there. So it's almost like you're, it's almost like doing a watercolor at this point. But I'm, I'm making, um, you know, I'm making compositional um, decisions and stuff that, um, that can easily change at this point, but um, it really helps me start to see the piece take shape. Okay, so I've got, I've got this blocked in and um, now I'm going to start applying the, the pastel. I'm going to just indicate um, a little bit of that shadow. So Lydia, there is another question. Sure. Um, it is, are you cleaning your brush or just redialing in alcohol, redipping? <laughs> there it was. It was a typo. Dipping it. And then I have a paper towel. So uh, what I do is I, after I make a stroke, I dip it. And then um, I kind of like clean it on my paper towel. So one of the things that I normally do, I mean, this is so small, but, you know, when I'm working big, I usually work. Um, top to bottom. So I do the sky first and I usually leave a little bit of a buffer zone around the darks so that they don't um, uh, contaminate the, you know, the, the sky doesn't get contaminated with the darks and vice versa. So, um, but in this case, this is so small, it's hard to, it's really hard to control that. And honestly, when I did um, when I was practicing on some of these demos, I wasn't using the um, uh, alcohol wash, but I really do like the, how it um, adds that depth to a piece for me. You can just take the, um, the new pastels, block them in, and you can use, this is a, it's foam, 
It's insulation pipe foam and I get it at Home Depot and you can blend with this. Um, what happens to me and a lot of people work this way and, and I do sometimes, but what happens to me is it leaves a lot more pastel residue on the board and the kiss of death with some of these sanded papers is if you put too much pastel on, you end up with a slick surface and then you can't apply any more pastel. So you have to be very judicious with how you apply the pastel. Um, so I tend to start- Lydia, could you show the foam on your other camera? Sure, it's right here. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> I just cut it in sections and you can see how I sharpen one edge. It's so that I can get in there and like, you know, get like fine detail. Like you can see like how I can use it here. You know, I can, I can um, soften that. So, so then the next step is to start building the soft pastel. And um, I'm gonna start with the sky. Actually, what I'm gonna do first is I'm go going to um, put uh, some more darks in. I'm gonna do what I call reinstating the darks. Um, and add a little bit more of that dark into the base of these trees. And then I'm going to uh, start with the sky. And I've got, um, when you paint the sky, it generally goes from more of a, a cobalt blue to more of a cyan blue. Um, and even in very limited amount of sky, you can see a transition. Um, and so that, that kind of gives you the sense that that sky is like wrapping around you overhead. So I've got a couple different, um, see if I can show you here. I've got a couple different blues that I'm gonna be working with. One is a darker cobalt blue that I'm gonna lay in on the top. And I have to um, wait until this dries. So I think it's pretty dry. And these, you know, you have to, um, because you're working so small, it can be a little challenging. So I tend to use more like um, niblets of pastel that, um, you know, are like broken pieces and stuff. Because you, you certainly can't really use a full um, stick. I'll show you one of my full sticks, just so you can get an idea of the Terry Ludwigs. They're pretty, they're pretty big. And generally, when I get those sticks, I break them anyway, but it's better to um, to use smaller pieces for this. So And I'm going to block in, I'm going to start blocking in the clouds. And the clouds in this photo um, have a slight upward swoop, which I'm going to emphasize a little bit more. And I'm using some uh, cool and warm grays. There are some cool grays in the photo here and um, some warmer grays, purplish grays underneath. And then I'm using um, some very muted pink, pinky whites for the tops of the clouds and for some of this back area. One of the things I forgot to mention in a, is I always have a, um, a sample like swatch of paper to the side so I can test my colors before I put them down if I need to. I'm 
and now I'm I'm locking in some of this more purpley gray that you see under the clouds. And I think I'm getting a little bit of curling on this paper. So I'm gonna, this is where this comes in handy. This, it's, it's like a little blending tool. I'm gonna go ahead and start locking in the top of those. And then I'm going to um, start blocking in the trees. And um, for the under painting of the tree, or for the, some of the under color, I'm gonna use a, kind of a magenta color. It's like a, a complement to the, um, the gold on top and it allows that gold to really sparkle. Maybe some rust. And I'm just, you know, I'm using a pretty light touch the tree that's receding back here has um, more of a muted purpley gray um, on it. So I've got this, it's a very grayed out purple pastel. So I'm gonna block that in. And also likewise on this side of the tree, And I'm gonna block in um, those mountains in the background. You can see how it's receding. Um, I'm gonna use a kind of a, a purple, or I'm sorry, a teal, grayish teal blue. And back where those clouds kind of hit that horizon, I'm going to use a very, almost light purpley color, but it's very grayed out. I use a lot of, um, they're called Giro's, and um, they're a smaller profile. Um, they're this, about this size. So they're a smaller profile. Um, so when you're doing more detailed work, they really are nice. You can get in there and really work on it. So, going to then start working on this background and using some very muted grays, gray greens for back in the background. Um, and And this tree, this tree has some kind of golds in it, some almost khaki golds, but you can see how nice those, um, those colors play with the purples. a little bit of stronger magentas over here. And then step back and um, I'm going to use some rusts in the um, foreground.
more rust. It's good to get this rust in because it acts like the dirt that's underneath of everything. Um, I'm going to bring in some of this lighter gold into the background fields. Kind of set that back. And then use a very um, purpley um, grayed out purple in the back. You guys are so quiet. We're all muted. <laughs> well, are riveted and <laughs> everything that you're doing. It's just beautiful. It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so Lydia, is this the technique that you use for your, um, for the piece in the Ba show? Yes. Yep. You, yeah. Did you start small with a small sample and then um, then do it? What is the size of the piece in the basho? It's hard to tell. Here's my little one. So it's tiny. Oh. <laughs> it's the same size as these. It's, here it is. Oh, yes. Yeah, you can see, like, I kind of figured out a lot of colors in it and stuff. So, yeah. But what size is the full size one? You know, it's only, uh, I think it's a either eight by 10 or nine by 12. I can't remember, um, but yeah. But a, like, you know, a lot of times I'll do this just because I want to understand my palette and how to figure it out. And when I, you can see on that picture that I showed of my palette, I kind of organize it by warms and cools and dark to light, chromatic, less chromatic to more chromatic. Um, so it just helps me figure out a lot of stuff beforehand when I do that. Um, and like I said, you know, it's just a two by two and a half by three and a half paper. So I'm not wasting anything to have to like trash that and start all over again. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much. You can, you can just talk as you wish. I'm, I'm going to mute myself again. Okay. I'm going to add a little bit of color up in here and then I'm going to start fleshing out that, that big tree. Adding some um, oranges. And I'm, I'm purposefully not painting the uh, trunk yet. I'll kind of put that in at the end. But you can see that the trunk is really, when it's a foliated tree, you can't really see it that well. But it's good to, um, to really understand trees. You have to draw them. And it's good to spend a lot of time drawing them in preparation for painting them. The danger that like I was just putting that pastel on and it was very um, it was very too hard. I couldn't I couldn't uh, put that color on top. I'm going to put a little bit of this shadow area here and then I'm going to go in and add some some green. And because I want this to sit back a little bit more, I'm going to um, use some of that uh, purpley gray on top of that to, to mute it a little bit. And then I'm going to uh, start coming forward with some of these greens in the, in the grass.
we lose a little bit more of the, uh, the rust in here. You'll have to forgive me, I'm working around my iPad. <laughs> Trying to, trying to see around it a little bit. And then I'm going to use some of the, the warmer greens um, up in here. Um, so I'm going to uh, start putting some of these, these golds in on this tree. So when you're painting these fall trees. Um, you can look on my website. I've got, I've got a number of paintings where I'm painting fall trees. Um, it really is important to start kind of with the color underneath. The temptation is to start like just putting down like golds and, and oranges and stuff. But if you don't get those colors underneath, you don't get that richness that's coming through. So, um, so I, I took a, um, a workshop with an artist once and uh, we we worked on um, painting fall trees and that's what they you know that's what I learned in that workshop is just to um, to build your colors up And then what I usually do is I start working the, um, the sky back into the tree to create those, um, the sky holes, um, you know, to get that kind of lacy effect on the edge of the tree. You know, you want to start like pulling the sky back into the tree. That's where I'm going to bring this down a little bit. And that's how you can, you know, get that that really uh, lacy edge. I use this foam brush that actually um, will pick off color. Um, I really like, you know, a lot of times like if I have too much pastel on, I'll just I'll just brush it back. And you can see how that that um, you know just makes that more subtle. And then, like for these branches, I'm just uh, using this is a new pastel, and it got broken, and it's got a really nice like sharp point on it. So you can draw branches, you know, just by using the edge of it and kind of uh, skipping it almost. You don't wanna, you don't wanna, when you draw branches, you don't wanna draw like that. You wanna, you wanna skip over and, and mimic the way branches grow, which is, you know, wider at the bottom and getting lighter and lighter. And generally, like if I'm doing a big piece, 
I use different color for the branches at the top than I do at the bottom because the branches, when things get to the top of the tree, it starts to, um, the, the light starts to infiltrate everything and everything gets lighter. So um, you have to really kind of pay attention to that. adding some little white marks. Use a softer, softer paint to kind of carve so that shape out. And then down a bit. And break up those edges and um, and this is another tool I use. This is just a stump and I'll you know I'll just soften edges with it as well. And then I'm going to maybe break up this tree a little bit here, add a little bit of sky hole into it. And I just kind of made a classic mistake here. I made my sky hole a little bit too light. And so what happens is you end up, it doesn't look realistic. So you have to really pay attention. And if you're putting a sky hole in, if you've got a value here, the sky hole should be a step down from that. And then to do those branches on the other side, I'll just, or the trunks, you know, just, again, it's like a, it's kind of a, just a drawing, you know, adding those little branches. So you kind of, you know, put the foliage in, then the sky holes, and then you draw the branches on top. And for that back area, I've got some, um, I think that's a little bit too bright. So I'm getting too many pastels in my hand now. Um, And then in the, the sample that I showed you, I ended up using kind of a brighter tealy green blue. This is this is actually pretty grayed out, um, but I really liked this color back here. So I'm going to put a little bit of that back. I like the way it vibrates with the um, with the mountain. And so now I'm just going to kind of finish up the front. Um, Hey, Lydia. Yeah. Um, some of us having a little bit of hard time hearing you now. Your voice is getting soft. <laughs> I'm going to finish up this front area. 
And another kind of common mistake is making um, some of the light areas in the, um, the, the land plane, you know, the flat plane, too light. And you can never really get lighter than the sky. So, um, you know, I, my, my inclination for this, this gold in here is to choose something super light and it would just, it would be too light. I, I can, I can add like a little bit of, uh, kind of a, what I call kissing marks, you know, like little tiny marks with it, but I want to, I want to keep this pretty subdued in the front because I want this to be more of the, the hero. This is where I'm gonna I'm gonna wipe back out a little bit, and that's what's cool about this um, this little um, tool, the foam the foam tool, is then you can go over it. Just some little bits of gold up here. Just gonna add a little bit where it's catching the light in the photo. And I think I think we're pretty close to being done. I think I'm going to maybe add a little bit of this bright. You see, even that feels too bright to me. And just add a little bit more of that um, purple shadow area. And I think there it is. And there's a little tiny tree way back here. I kind of like the way it's it's giving it a sense of distance. So I'm just gonna break up this space back here with a little little uh, point of light to kind of draw your eye to the background. And I think that's pretty close. I think I'm going to stop there now. Does anybody have any questions about this? I wish you could see it better. Maybe we could just take a picture and then share it after the fact. It's all good. That. Yeah. Even what we're able to see, I'm going to say it was just magical. So thank you for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. I think what I'll do is I'll just send you, um, Ed, some photos afterwards. Okay. So, let's see. So Livia, can you talk a little bit how you go from this tiny size then to a um, your bigger painting? Sure. Um, I don't really grid as much as um, you know. A lot of people do grid out things. What I do is when I start a piece, I always um, I guess it is gridding, but it's very loose gridding. You know, I figure out my center point. And then I do my thirds, my horizon line. Um, and then I basically, you know, for me, I tend to kind of eyeball it. But one of the things that happens a lot is when I go from a small piece to a large piece, it changes. Um, and usually I feel like it's for the better, you know, I learn things. And so, um, I generally like have this, I have this, my grayscale piece, 
up there, but I, I'm kind of, of the mind that I like, I like to be fluid in the process and I don't like to be so set in, you know, my first, inter and like I said, you know, I'll, I have, I have like three of these and each one is slightly different. And so um, I like to think that with each one I'm learning. So when I transfer it to the bigger piece, um, you know, I will make adjustments, but I feel like partially with me, it's because I have drawn my background when I was in school was in drawing. And so I've drawn for a really long time and I really understand perspective and seeing that way. So I think I can tend, I tend to catch um, issues, you know, um, before they're real big problems in a piece. So, um, but I'm, I'm not like, I don't actually grid it out like super tight or anything like that. And I also, I didn't really talk about too much, but I do paint a lot in plein air. And I think that forces you to see and really um, simplify and understand really well, like um, how to translate what you're seeing in, in this big space into a two dimensional surface. So I think, I think it's really a matter of, for me, the fact that I've, I've been doing pastels about 20 years, but I've been drawing for most of my life. And um, so I think that, um, you know, I, I don't generally have a lot of problem translated, translating it. That said, I don't work, I have worked probably the largest pastel I've done is like 22 by 28. And, um, and that, that was, I had to be really careful and kind of grid out. And then Jill's familiar with this. I did a commission for somebody and it was buildings. And I don't, I haven't done that many buildings. And this was like a building that he had worked at as a kid. It's, it was an old lumber company up in Cheyenne. And I really did like, I mean, that I drew and I drew big and I actually, you know, almost like traced my drawing onto my canvas. But that was like, you know, with, with trees and landscape, you have a little bit more um, flexibility. You know, when you're drawing a building, you don't, you know, somebody's going to know if it doesn't look right. Um, whereas, you know, that tree, they're not going to know, or that mountain, unless it's a mountain that they are like the flat irons, you know, like everybody's like, oh, she missed the, you know, she missed the third flat iron. So, um, but, you know, even so, like I, I just, I did a plein air piece um, of the Tetons. It's on my website not too long ago. And I know I missed some things on it, but, you know, I'm like, if somebody wants to, you know, they're going to have to sue me, you know, to say, say I, I didn't get the third Teton exactly correct in that painting. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, if you're doing certain things and I do plan to do more buildings and stuff and I'll have to be a little bit more deliberate with how I transfer those drawings over to the board, but I still, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm more of an impressionist type painter. And so I don't like things. I just, for myself, I don't like things like super tight. I like a little bit looser, um, more in, uh, of an interpretive um, expression in, in a piece. So I think it's, for me, at least, it's easier to be impressionist when it's so small, because it forces you to forego some of the detail when it's something like a two and a half by three and a half card. Yep. I think that translation to a larger piece, sometimes there's that balance to how much detail do you put in versus right. just scaling up that level of abstractness. Yes. So do you have any advice on that? Well, I think that is a challenge. And I think, you know, um, yeah, it's it, it because what what can look really abstract, but hold together in a small piece when you take it up, those marks can all of a sudden be distracting, you know? Um, so I think you just have to really be paying attention to how you create 
those marks in the large piece. I, the piece that I did that was like um, the 22 by 28 piece, it, um, it's called View to the Winds. And I remember, you know, I, I struggled with some of that, but what I, what I ended up doing was really paying attention to what my focal point was and then letting other areas fall off, you know, getting more abstract. And that's um, when you paint plein air, that teaches you to see that way. That's really how you see. And that's kind of one of the dangers of just working from photos for people is that they want to interpret everything in that photo, um, you know, literally. But when you're out painting plein air, you can't do that. And so you really have to um, be, um, you know, pay attention, put more focus on that, um, the focal point, and then really like let all the other pieces in the painting support that focal point and just, get looser with those pieces. And, um, and then that'll make that focal point that much more precious. So. Thank you. That's great advice. Uh, Lydia, I have a question. Could you talk a little bit about your process and how you get this piece that you just finished into a uh, greeting card? Do you use fixative or how do you actually get it from this stage? Well, when I've given these as greeting cards, honestly, I put them in the clear bags and I mount them using like a really good double stick tape onto like I buy like a really nice acid free, uh, like a crescent board and cut it and then, you know, put it into the greeting card like that. Um, because pastels by their very nature, you know, the soft pastels, anyway, they're just, they're very fragile. And so generally when I give them to, to people, I give them a little card. Um, I sell a lot of unframed pastels at like the little galleries that I'm at. Like there's one in Niwot, that's, that's really all she has um, it, are my unframed pastels. And I have a little note on the back telling people when they take the pastel out of there, when they're gonna frame it, they should cut it. They should cut it and lift it off, not slide it. Cause again, like, you know, I don't fix my stuff. I don't fix my pastels. I use, sometimes I use what's called a workable fixative. And um, I use like, um, it's the Degas workable fixative. And I'll do that in an underpainting. And what that does is it allows you to put more pastel on and it, it darkens some of those underpainting layers. Um, but I really feel like when, and I know that there are pastelists that do fix paintings. And I, I remember there was this woman, I think she's no longer alive, uh, Virginia Wood. She was a really um, big abstract pastelist in, um, in Boulder. She had a gallery or, or a workspace over by the brewery and she had mixed her own fixative and her pastels were beautiful, but you know, it, it was like her trade secret. Um, a lot of times because pastels really, people don't understand what they are. They're pure pigment, you know, like they're, they're what go, go into an oil paint an acrylic paint, a watercolor. They're just basically in a dry form and they're bound with, I think it's like called something like gum Arabic. And um, if you ever wanna, um, Terry Ludwig's in Denver, I took some of my students down there um, on a field trip one time and they showed us how they um, mix the, you know, they get the, um, the pure pigment in and then they mix it with the binder and that's something that's their secret. And then they put it in molds, they dry it in a dryer for I don't know how long. It's like an oven and then they um they they're in these molds and then they pop them out they sand them down to the color um so they're really just pigment um so that to me is the beauty of the pastel like when you look at a pastel up close like like you look at a Degas and it was done you know hundreds of years ago it is as pure and brilliant as it was when he painted it 
because there's nothing in there, like with an oil paint, you know, how the mediums will cause it to tarnish and um, change color, the pastels won't. And so when I frame my pastels, I, um, I use spacers, I put them into, um, I don't use, I used to use mats, but the general kind of rule of thumb now is most artists, pastelists, don't use mats because um, it makes it look less like a drawing and more like a oil painting when you just frame it right in the frame. And so I use spacers in there. And there is a little bit of a fall off, but um, boy, when you look at a pastel and you look at it under the light and you can see that shimmer, you know, there's just, to me, there's like no other medium that you can get that with. So I don't want to destroy it. And I, you know, I know there are people that have fixatives that they, they swear by, <laughs> but um, I'm not sold. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Well, Lydia, I, um, some of us know an artist who um, does oil pastels and he always uses complementary colors beneath his, um, Right, so you know what I'm talking about. So if you're doing blue, he would do orange first and then blue. Do you use that sometimes? I do, yeah, yeah. But when you think about it, like when you look at the sky um, in this, it's got pink under it, which isn't, you know, it's, it's a warm color under and it kind of peeks through. I don't know if you can see that very well, but... Um, but oftentimes, yeah, I'll use, like I'm using the purple, this reddish purple underneath of these oranges. And yeah. so that's giving you that, that's what gives it that, that oomph and that vibrancy. So, I mean, often in nature you find it's, there's a compliment, you know? So, but sometimes I'll just use, um, especially like when I'm painting snow scenes, I'll just use a pure, like I'll tone the whole thing orange and have you know have that warmth come through if it's a sunny um sunlit snow scene i'll do that but um oftentimes i'll use compliments but i generally go with kind of um i look at those shadow areas that i'm seeing in the photo and i'll paint that underneath and i generally paint the brighter colors up front and then as i go back i use duller um, hard pastels and you know more a little bit more grayed out muted colors as I go back, and then I reinforce that when I apply the pastel on top. But I like color, so no, <laughs> those thanks. pieces are pretty colorful. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? You can unmute for a question. I'm a retired teacher and they say to always pause and let everybody get a chance to think before they speak up. It's a good skill. <laughs> I'm happy to share anything with people, you know, so if you want to reach out to me on my website or email, if you have a question after the meeting, I'm happy to share what I know so You've inspired far. <laughs> me to paint again. I haven't done pastels in a long time. <laughs> you know, get out there, Jill. <laughs> I did, yeah, I know. Well, I, if you have an opening in your Zoom classes, I might check that out. Okay, yeah. Next time. Once every two weeks, so. Cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I also, this was great. Thank you so much for doing this. And, um, I, I'm a watercolorist, so I'm going to um, get myself some more watercolor pencils and play around with doing some real small ones. I think that will be a, a good learning tool for me. So, yeah. 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 One thing I didn't mention is um, I don't use a lot of pastel pencils. Like you saw at the beginning, I used a pencil to kind of draw the, just sketch the rough shapes in. And on these, I don't really use, I guess you could do, you know, really tight drawings this small, but for me, the purpose of this is to keep it pretty simple. And so, yeah. um, but I generally like, I'll use pastel pencils 
almost now I used to use them a lot more. Now I use them kind of like in a sky. If I want a really smooth surface, I'll, you know, put my, my pastels down and, and I very rarely like blend, really blend my pastels because I don't work super tight. Um, but then I'll take a pencil, like if it's a, you know, blue sky, I'll take a pale lavender or um, a pink and kind of just scumble that over. And it actually, it's kind of cool because it actually will blend those pastels without, um, if you over blend pastels, you lose that crystalline structure. So what happens with pastels, because they are pure pigment, they're crystalline structure. And when the light refracts off of it, that's what causes that shimmer. And if you, mm -hmm. if you put too much pressure on them, you just kind of smash them. So it's just- Lydia, I I'm gonna show that you're painting from the show just so maybe you could talk about that. Okay. Cause I was looking at the sky on this one and- Yeah, this is, um, so I did this from a photo. I did not do it plein air. <laughs> um, it was um, out at Sawhill Ponds when we were out there. Um, I don't know, it was like two weeks ago, we were walking. And, um, and so this, um, you know, the sun was going down and it was uh, really um, just, you know, you know how the foothills get that beautiful purplish blue and, um, and everything starts to fade away. And then you get that robin's egg blue up in the sky. And, um, and so anyway, I was just um, really playing with the, um, the color, not only of the sky, but um, how it reflected in the water. And um, this is called skim ice on Sawhill Pond. And also with those shapes, how the, um, how the, the light was reflecting into those ice shapes in the foreground and kind of leading you into the background. Um, so yeah, I was just, I've, I've been in a bit of a winter painting mode lately. Um, this is probably the third or fourth snow scene I've done. I'm probably, I'm praying for snow right now. So I'm trying to put all this good juju out there to get some snow, <laughs> get some moisture. <laughs> so yeah. Um, but this again, I started with um, those, you can see those darks. I started with a Terry Ludwig, blocked in my darks um, in that tree area and the bank. And um, I think under the, under the, um, the water and that sky area, I used like a pink underpainting and I used a more of a purple in the background um, of purple violet under under those mountains. And then I just started layering, layering the color on top and really playing with the fact that, you know, when you paint um, sunsets, you know, you use those oranges and peaches, but, you know, as you move in towards the actual um, um, sun, you get lighter in value, you know, for, for the very center of that sun is white and then it's a light yellow and then it goes to the orange and to the golds and, and pinks and, and then out to the purples. So I was really playing with that. And, um, and then how the light would affect some of those really background distant trees in the background, um, you know, getting just the shadow shapes of those trees in there. So yeah, and playing with them, um, the shapes of those branches, it was really fun. Like in some cases where the sun is hitting them, you know, I actually just um, kind of scraped back in to get those, those mauve branches, um, you know, scraped through the color of the sunlight. Cause with a, with a painting like this, and you know, I've been, it's, it's been challenging for me because I haven't done a lot of these kinds of paintings, but like I said, the last couple paintings I've done have been this subject. And so, um, you know, I really am trying to understand how trees, you know, how they are dark at the base. And then as they get um, lighter, they get lighter as they get out from the base and are catching more light. And especially, 
in a sunset painting, like the branches at the top almost get to be like, um, you know, an orange kind of purple color. <laughs> and so I was really playing a lot with that. Oh, well, I think it's a great painting. And uh, I just keep looking at that sky. <laughs> it's really amazing. Um, you're also getting a lot of great um, comments in the uh, in the chat as well. So. Oh, good. Thanks, Lydia. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you guys. Um, yeah, and like I said, if anybody has any questions and if you wanna see any of my work uh, in person, um, I've got work up at the Art Center of Estes and then there's a gallery up in Allen's Park. I have oils and pastels and, um, and then I've got, you know, I'm always happy to show people work at my gallery too, at my home. Um, I've got a gallery, you can kind of see it behind me. I've got, um, an area, I have a, a oil set up and a pastel set up. And, um, and that's been something I've been working on over the last year is learning another medium has really been great because it's forced me to understand pastels more, <laughs> if that makes sense. I think it's good to get out of your comfort zone and try something new. And um, I really didn't do any pastels this last year until about four months ago. And gosh, it's been so much fun. It's been a joy to get back to it. So um, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Uh, unless we have any last minute questions, I think that's our meeting for today. Any other comments or questions? Um, thank you so much, Lydia. I really, it was a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. And uh, <laughs> I, I look forward to be able to see your art in person sometime. So um, great. And I'll send you some of these. I'll send you these pictures too. Okay. Okay. All right. Great.